really great opportunity, I think, for for learners while we're not able to kind of do our standard, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> standard yeah. education. So it's fantastic. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to um, turn off my video and mute myself. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and get going with your talk. Okay. And appreciate okay. you being here, Dana. I really yeah, appreciate so it. All right. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dana Crosby, and as you may have heard, I'm at Southern Illinois University. I'm the rhinologist and endoscopic skull-based skull surgeon here, and also I'm an associate professor and program residency program director. So I really do, as I just was saying, I think this is such a, a great thing that is being done for resident education across the country. Um, I think I know that the residents here are feeling a little bit empty because they're not able to access the normal um, educational activities. And so I think that this is a really good supplement during this certainly very unusual time. So um, we'll get started with talking about management of the frontal sinus. And um, I think, as we all know, this is really the most challenging sinus of all um, to work on. And really across the board, um, I think it's the most challenging for residents to learn um, and to teach. And I think there are a few reasons for that. Uh, for the, firstly, it's the most anterior and superior of the sinuses, meaning it's not straight ahead like the majority of the other sinuses. Um, the ethmoids, um, sphenoid, you can access pretty easily with a zero degree scope. You're looking straight ahead and all of your instrument instrumentation is straight. Um, However, with the frontal sinus, that's a little bit different. We're really working in the anterior superior part and we need different instrumentation to access this area. Um, also, the outflow tract and ostium are very narrow. Um, it's not a very large diameter, uh, making it uh, pretty difficult to access. There's also a significant variation in the air cell pattern of the ethmoids surrounding the outflow tract of the frontal sinus. Um, and also, I think one of the big things is it's just a little bit scary to learn as a resident because of the important surrounding structures, including the brain and the eye. And nobody wants to find themselves in either of those structures or causing damage to either of those structures. So I think that there's some hesitation um, on the part of learners when working in the frontal sinus. And then also really no two frontal sinuses are the same and every one that you tackle is going to be different and have a slightly different distribution of cells or layout or pattern of those cells that you need to recognize preoperatively so that you can um, be prepared and kind of have um, an idea of what you're getting into before you actually start the case. So let's talk a little bit more about the frontal sinus and its drainage passage. Um, so when I think about the frontal sinus, I really do kind of break the frontal recess and the frontal ostium up into two different structures. For me, the frontal recess, I consider really this is the space into which the frontal sinus drains. It contains a number of cells that can affect the position of the frontal ostium. It sits between the lamina papricia, as you can see here, and the basal lamella, again, or the, I'm sorry, the la vertical lateral lamella. And again, these are two important structures that you want to be aware of and um, can look a little bit different from patient to patient. Um, and then also, it's the frontal recess is kind of anterior to skull base and basal lamella and posterior to the frontal beak. So those are kind of the confines of what I like to consider the frontal recess. And we'll compare that now to um, how I think about the frontal ostium. To me, the frontal ostium is the narrowest part of the transition zone from the frontal sinus to the frontal recess. Um, and this is kind of bounded by the frontal beak anteriorly and the skull base posteriorly. And again, this is something that you want to look at preoperatively and see what the actual anatomic diameter of your frontal ostium is to give you a sense of the kind of instrumentation you may need to work in that frontal sinus. So when we think about the anatomy of the frontal sinus, I think um, it's always important to think about the cells surrounding the frontal sinus. And I don't worry too much about what we call those cells, but I think it's important to recognize those cells exist. That being said, it is fairly heavily tested on in-service exam and boards. So I think that um, we do need to have some uh, familiarity with the names of these cells. 
Um, and I'm first going to go through kind of the traditional Kuhn classification described in um, 96, um, subsequently updated in about 2003 by Wormald. Um, and on this table, anything in regular print is the initial Kuhn description, and then anything that has been italicized is the updated Wormald uh, modifications in 2003. And so I just would like to mention um, kind of the type one through four cells uh, on this slide. So the type one cell was classically described as the single cell above the agar nazi. The type two cell, um, this is when there are two or more cells above the agar nazi, but still remaining um, below or inferior to the frontal beak. Type three cells are cells that pneumatize into the frontal ostium, and this was updated to include less than 50% of the height of the frontal sinus. Type four cells were initially described as the isolated frontal cells and then updated um, in 2003 to um, be thought of as cells pneumatizing into the frontal ostium, but exceeding greater than 50% of the height of the frontal sinus. And so I think that this is still tested. I think this is still something we think about, but there was an interesting updated classification system published in um, almost four years ago now, actually in 2016. Um, and I really like this classification because it is very descriptive. It really describes what the cell type is doing and um, kind of what the cell itself is. So the name for once in anatomy actually makes sense. And so I, I kind of like um, this classification. And so this is what I ask my residents to use. And when they come to the operating room, I ask them to kind of tell me about these cell types. And really, again, it's not that I care so much about what that cell is called, but I care that that residents have looked at the films in advance and understand the frontal sinus outflow tract and how this, the ethmoid cells and um, frontal sinus cells can be impacting where the drainage passage is going to be. So this is kind of broken up nicely. Um, so we'll first kind of look at the anterior cells. So the anterior cells, um, Again, it really makes sense. Anterior cells are cells that sit anteriorly in the frontal sinus. So it makes sense that if you have cells anteriorly, it's gonna push your drainage pathway posteriorly and often um, medially or posterior medially. These are typically laterally based cells. Um, so within this, within this group of the classification, we have the agar nazi cell, the supra agar cell, and the supra agar frontal cell. And as we go through some of these, you'll see that the names really are descriptive. Um, and I think, again, that's just really helpful. So the Agarnazi cell, this is a cell that um, has been present since, since the classic um, um, description. So this is not terribly new. The Agarnazi cell sits behind the frontal beak. And um, on the coronal CT here, you can see its relationship to the middle turbinate. The Agarnazi cell typically sits anterior to the origin of the middle turbinate or directly above the most anterior insertion of the middle turbinate into the lateral nasal wall. So again, just kind of looking at this agar nazi cell, you see it just behind the frontal beak here, um, just a little bit below, below the beak. Um, and then you can kind of see in the coronal its relationship to the middle turbinate. Moving on to the next um, cell type in the anterior group, this is the supra agar cell. So again, it makes sense. It's the cell superior to the agar nazi cell. So in this sagittal view, you see your um, agar nazi cell and then one cell above it before you get into your frontal sinus. And what's important to notice is um, this true frontal ostium where the frontal beak um, projects most prominently, the most narrow point between the frontal beak and the posterior table um, that's your, again, your frontal ostium. This cell, this super agar cell does not pneumatize past that point into the true frontal sinus itself. This can be a single cell or it can be multiple cells so long as it doesn't cross that plane of the frontal beak. And then moving on to the super frontal agar cell. So this classific classification has frontal in the name. So that tells you that this cell is going to pneumatize into the frontal cell, frontal sinus itself. So again, it's above the auger, but um, now pneumatizing above that narrowest point of the frontal ostium into the frontal sinus. 
Um, one nice way to identify if this really is um, a frontal, suprafrontal auger cell <clears throat> is to look at the coronal and um, determine if there's extension into the frontal. You look for the thick beak and identify what looks like kind of this isolated cell. We know it's not because we, we can see this in three planes, but you see this, this cell that does extend into the frontal sinus. And then back to our classification, we'll move on to the posterior cells. Um, the posterior cells, again, they sit in the posterior aspect of the frontal sinus and they push the drainage passage now anteriorly. Within this group, we have the suprabulla cell, the suprabulla frontal cell, and the supraorbital ethmoid cell. So we'll take a look at each of those. Um, and again, the suprabulla bulla cell. This is a cell that, not shockingly, sits ab above the bulla ethmoidalis um, and <clears throat> almost has um, the anterior aspect of these cells is typically almost kind of in continuity. So the, the bulla and the superbulla cell have this kind of continuous anterior face. Um, and again, what's important to notice is this does not cross into the frontal sinus. So frontal is not in the name of this cell, so superbulla cell. Next, we have the suprabulla frontal cell, and you can see a pattern here. Now we have frontal in the name, so this is a cell that does extend past that um, natural ostium into the frontal sinus. Um, so moving on to the last of these cells in this type, the supraorbital ethmoid cell. And again, this has been talked about since the original classification, so it's not particularly new, uh, but it is an important cell to recognize and understand. So basically, when you look at a coronal CT, this is kind of that little bit of, of the uh, nippling above the um, orbit itself. Um, in this patient, they have a particularly well pneumatized supraorbital ethmoid cell. You don't always see it pneumatized this well. Um, but it is really important to look at your supraorbital ethmoid cell because typically when it is more pneumatized like this, you have a more significant risk of having your um, anterior ethmoid artery below the skull base. And so that is indeed the case in this, uh, this particular patient. So you can see because that superorbital ethmoid cell is pneumatized, it's pneumatized up over the orbit even more posteriorly, allowing this um, anterior ethmoid artery to be more pedicled rather than within the skull base. And then our last group within this um, newer classification is the medial cell. And there's only one medial cell. But again, pretty intuitive. When you have a medial cell, this can push the uh, drainage passage laterally. And so the only uh, member of this group is the frontal septal cell. And um, you can see an example here. This is um, basically um, the interfrontal uh, sinus septum that becomes pneumatized and pushes that dra drainage passage laterally. Um, if you have a, a situation like this, often the bone separating this frontal septal cell can be fairly thick, and we'll see example, an example of this in a video later in the procedure, uh, or in the, in the talk, but um, often that, that septation can be thick and require uh, powered instrumentation if you find yourself in a situation where you do need to take that down. So when we're thinking about working in the frontal sinus, I, me I mentioned that it is anterior and superior, which we all know, but because of that, we have to use um, specialized instrumentation with this um, 55 to 90 degree angle that allows us to work more anteriorly and superiorly. Um, so we just have a couple of examples of the instrumentation that's commonly used in the, in the frontal sinus. We have the mushroom punches, the Hoseman and upturned mushroom punch. We have through cutting instrumentation, um, for a delicate work of taking down septations. We have frontal sinus probes and curettes. And then um, we have a backbiting kerosene um, to help us open um, the frontal sinus as well. And then when we think about powered instrumentation, we're really thinking of a couple different things. Um, the micro debrider, which you can um, identify, you can have 60 degree angles to work in within the frontal sinus recess. And then if you need to drill, this is um, an example of a 70 degree burr that's commonly used for frontal sinus drill outs. 
And then also it's important to think about the scopes that you're using when working in the frontal sinus. So the traditional um, post scope is shown below in this picture. And this is when the post comes off in the opposite direction of the angle of the scope itself. So you can see the angle in this bottom picture is looking up while the post is down. And when we're really working, trying to work in that anterior superior area of the sinuses, sometimes we really need to drop the back end of that scope down. And you can imagine with this post, if there's also a light cord, light cord attached to this post, you may start to run into the patient's chest, especially depending on their body habitus. And that may limit how much you can look up into the frontal sinus, even with a 70 degree scope at times. Um, and so we have the option of using, um, pictured here as a reverse post scope, where the post now comes off in the same direction as the angle of the scope. So this allows the light cord to be um, going up away from the patient so it doesn't limit your range of motion. And then um, there are, not pictured here, there are also 90 degree posts where the posts come off the side and give you that same um, improved range of motion. So let's just kind of talk about the extent of frontal sinus surgery um, in kind of a, a logical fashion here, kind of starting from the most minimal surgery to the most maximal surgery. And um, this classification was put out by uh, PJ Wormald as well as a lot of other people um, in 2017. And it kind of goes along with that 2016 classification. Um, and it's just kind of a different way to think about um, frontal sinus surgery. In this paper, they actually talk about potentially relating um, billing and reimbursement to the extent of the surgery that's uh, been done. That hasn't happened yet, but it, um, it is something that's been discussed. So um, the initial uh, classification here is grade zero, and this is balloon sinuplasty. So we'll take a look at that first. So balloon sinuplasty, um, as we all know, is the atraumatic dilation um, and mucosal sparing procedure where you basically insert a balloon into the frontal ostium and then expand that balloon, creating micro fractures in the bones surrounding the ostium um, and expanding that ostium without traumatizing the mucosa. Um, this is a procedure that I would say for very specific indications. It's not something that I could count on. If, you know, I could count on one hand how many times I've done this in my five years in practice, but um, there are some indications that I do think it makes sense for. I will say this um, image here, this CT, this was not my patient. This was pulled from the paper. Um, I'm not sure you know, what the pathology is here, but um, this is not somebody I would be thinking about doing sinus surgery on. But you can see that after the balloon dilation, um, there is a larger outflow tract of the frontal sinus. Um, moving on to kind of the next group where we're removing cells, but we're not really removing bone of the ostium itself. And so this group, I kind of um, correlate with what we have historically called a draft one. So you're really just removing the cells, but not working on the ostium or within the, within the frontal sinus itself. So grade one, you remove cells below the frontal ostium. Grade two, cells are removed from within the frontal ostium. Grade three, cells are removed above the frontal ostium. And then the last classification, this is when you're actually removing some of that thick bone of the ostium itself. So grade four is a correlate to a draft 2A, um, where the frontal sinus ostium is widened by removing bone, including the frontal beak. Um, and then a grade five is more similar to a draft 2B, uh, where you do the unilateral frontal drill out from medial orbital wall to the septum. Grade six, and uh, this is basically your bilateral frontal drill out, modified low throp, draft three, whatever you like to call it, all, all mean the same thing, but a full drill out procedure. So let's take a look at these procedures a little bit more closely. Um, and this is just some pictures of what you would expect to find when you've done um, these various draft procedures or if you use the more recent classification but um, this is your draft one. So you've basically removed the cells below the, um, below the sinus, but you haven't really worked on the, the ostium or removed bone of the ostium. When we look at a draft 2A, you have now widened this ostium from the middle turbinate to the, um, the lamina, and now you have removed some of the frontal beak and you have a much wider frontal ostium. <clears throat> 
we move on to a draft 2B, where now you've removed the anterior aspect of this middle turbinate, and we have an opening now from the septum to the lamina unilaterally. A draft three or modified low throb drill out procedure. Um, we basically do a draft to, to be on both sides um, and remove the nasal septum that intervenes as well. So I just wanted to take a look at um, some of these procedures. So just this is an example of a draft two A. And I was mentioning before I started this talk that it's been uh, it seems like it's been an eternity since I've done. A fess at this point. Um, so when I was looking at this, these videos last night, I was looking at them very longingly. But um, this is a, a procedure that I, I did. This is just a draft 2A. And you can see in this procedure, we've opened the ethmoids. And now we're kind of looking up into this agronazi cell. And this was a fairly straightforward um, frontal sinus. So I'm using that curved um, 55 degree uh, front to back frontal sinus through cut to remove some of the posterior aspect of, of the um, agronazi cell. And I'm just kind of showing that it's uh, starting to be a little bit more mobile. I'm now using that backbiting kerosene to kind of come across the top of the agronazi cell and kind of uncap the egg. And you can see now that I've done that and have a fairly widely patent uh, draft 2A, um, just showing that we can kind of pass the suction easily. Um, and you can see that this is now open from the middle turbinate to the lamina. And I'm just kind of showing the Hosman punch, uh, taking down some, some of the um, remaining partitions of the lamina. But, um, you know, this is kind of a nice open draft 2A. Um, you see that there's basically mucosa draped surrounding the majority of the um, frontal ostium there. And that's kind of what you want things to look like at the end of a 2A. And now we'll just take a look at a draft three for comparison. Um, and this is a patient who had kind of a unilateral issue. There was a tumor that continued to recur. So ultimately it was decided that this patient should have a draft three for improved surveillance and a better opening, um, even though the uh, opposing side was not um, terribly diseased. Um, so you can kind of see this in various planes. At this point in the video, I've already done a draft 2A on both sides. Um, and I've taken down the anterior uh, portions of the middle turbinate um, to get better exposure so that we can kind of, once we take out the septum, we'll be able to see um, both sides of, or both um, frontal sinuses. Um, so you can kind of see that we're just kind of showing both sides here using hand instrumentation. So one thing I like to do when I'm doing um, a draft three is to really use hand instrumentation as much as possible because it really is more efficient. So any thin bone, bony work that can be done, I like to do with hand instrumentation. It really helps move things along. So I'm just using this Hoseman punch here. Um, and now I'm taking down the intervening um, nasal septum um, just with a microdebreeder at this point, um, just kind of opening things up. And fairly soon you'll be able to see, we're starting to see now actually, that you can see both frontal sinuses from, from both sides. Um, and we'll, I'm just continuing to kind of take down that intervening septum. Um, and again, you see when I can, I switch back to handheld rather than uh, powered instrumentation just to save some time. Um, this patient, as you'll see in a few seconds here, actually had a fairly large frontal septal cell that was incorporated into this draft three cavity. And I'm just um, kind of drilling that open at this point. Um, and once that's incorporated, you'll kind of see that nice horseshoe shaped um, opening that we expect. So this is just showing that frontal septal cell. Um, and there's just proof that it does exist. Um, so then taking down more of those thin, thinner bony partitions and just getting that nice uh, horseshoe shaped cavity that we expect to see. And one thing that's important to think about when doing a draft three is there are different ways to do draft three. So this is kind of the traditional inside out approach. There's also the outside in approach um, that's been described and kind of uh, popularized more um, from some of the uh, rhinologists in Australia. So you have options of how to do these procedures. And this is just placement of uh, thin silastic sheeting um, uh, stents to kind of help maintain patency. 
Um, when I do these cases now, this was done uh, about five years ago, I do tend to put in drug eluding, steroid eluding stents into my draft three cavities now, um, rather than the, the thin silastic sheeting. So thinking about some of the complications that can occur when doing these procedures. So as, we, as I mentioned earlier, there is high, um, high stakes real estate kind of surrounding, surrounding us when we're working in the frontal sinus. So if we get a little bit too posterior, um, we can end up with a CSF leak. If we get a little too lateral, we can end up with an orbital injury. Um, and again, posteriorly, kind of behind that um, superorbital ethmoid cell, you can end up with an anterior ethmoid artery bleed. And then also probably most common of all of these is stenosis of the frontal ostium. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these complications. Um, so this is an example of an iatrogenic CSF leak. And I presume that in this patient, somebody may have thought that they were um, at the frontal sinus ostium and uh, inserted an instrument kind of in this direction rather than in, in this direction. Um, and you can see this, this breach in the skull base. And what's important about CSF leaks is actually just recognizing that it happened. Um, you know, I think that uh, most rhinologists do enough skull base surgery that we see CSF fairly commonly. Um, and when you see it, it's, it's, it may be subtle, but, it, but it's still fairly obvious. You see that clear pulsatile fluid that you would not otherwise expect to see. And I think it's important that anytime we're doing sinus surgery that, that we have just a high index of, of suspicion and you continually, continually reassess that skull base because sometimes the skull base can just be very thin and, and very small maneuvers can disrupt that skull base. Um, but it's important to just keep in mind that this is possible. It is not 0%. So, um, you know, I think one of the hardest things about CSF leaks and um, it's not managing them or fixing them, it's recognizing it and admitting that it happened. I think as surgeons, we, we like to think, well, that could not have happened to me. You know, that's, that's you know, not in my hands. I don't get CSF leaks. But I think that if you go in <laughs> to every case, sorry, with the, um, with the idea that anything could happen in any case and just be aware that, that it can happen to you, you're more likely to recognize it and be prepared to fix it when it happens. The other thing is, I think if you're doing sinus surgery, you should really be comfortable fixing a CSF leak. And I think all of us get a lot more experience and opportunity repairing CSF leaks now um, because of all of the skull base work that we do. And so this is something that really probably could be repaired by a pretty simple free mucosal graft. Um, and the patient would do very well. I always say that these patients typically do, do quite well. They don't have a lot of long-term sequela, as long as it's just a small fracture. I have seen patients and heard crazy stories of this happening and then the micro debrider gets inserted and a bunch of brain gets debrided. That's, that's a different story. Um, but if it's just a small fracture with a small CSF leak, these patients do well. And I always kind of say that it tends to bruise our ego more than it actually hurts the patient. But that being said, still try not to do it. Um, moving on to anterior ethmoid arteries. So typically when I'm giving this lecture in person, um, I would ask which side of the nose we're looking at in this patient. Um, it's important to understand that the ethmoid artery um, is very conserved. It's always at that posterior aspect of the superorbital ethmoid cell, and it always runs in the same direction. So this is the right side of the nose, and we can tell that because the anterior ethmoid artery always runs in a posterior to anterior direction when we're going lateral to medial. So this is the lateral side, posterior to anterior in kind of this um, angled direction. And if we were to remo remove um, kind of all the structures in between, the um, anterior ethmoid arteries on each side kind of make that V with the, the point of the V pointing anteriorly. So if you just see the direction of an anterior ethmoid artery, you should be able to know which side of the, the nose you're the nose you're on. And it'll also help you because a lot of times you'll see like a little partition running this direction and you think to yourself, oh, is that the anterior ethmoid artery? Should I not, you know, take down that partition? But if you just remember this orientation, you can feel more confident about taking down that partition without getting into the anterior ethmoid artery. And this is a very nice example of an anterior ethmoid artery. They're not always as prominent as this.
So another um, complication that we can have during uh, surgery on the frontal sinus. Um, so sometimes in the operating room, you kind of get this um, example where you have this nice draft 2A, everything looks great, you feel really great about yourself and you feel like you're an awesome surgeon and you're doing your little party dance in the operating room. And then the patient comes back to see you and you see something that looks like this and you don't feel so great about yourself anymore. And this is the case where you've had some stenosis of the ostium or um, just kind of some scarring, uh, mucosal scarring, um, covering that natural ostium. So what can we do to avoid um, osteostenosis or um, scarring or covering over of the frontal sinus ostium with mucosa? So some of the things that we talk about are incomplete surgery. So retained uncinate, uh, retained frontal sinus cells. So all those cells that we talked about at the beginning of this uh, lecture, some of those cells could be retained and not fully removed, um, causing narrowing of the frontal ostium. And then also lateralized middle turbinate itself or a remnant of a middle turbinate. And a lot of these things I hear kind of talked about as historical things that don't really happen that much in sinus surgery anymore. Um, you know, I, I kind of hear at rhinology meetings that everybody's good at taking down the uncinate and keeping their, their turbinates uh, medialized. I can say in my practice that that is not what I see. A lot of revision surgery, I still see a lot of retained uncinate. I see really lateralized uh, middle turbinates um, and some, some unusual sinus surgery um, that is fairly incomplete. So um, I think these things definitely still do exist. Um, and I think that they are common causes of failure. And then also we need to think about excessive removal of mucosa. So any of you that have done a lot of uh, sinus surgery and you, you've worked with your rhinologists, I'm sure that they get a little uptight when they start seeing mucosa being stripped. And that's especially true within the frontal sinus um, because it is so narrow and, and such a much higher risk of stenosis than the other sinuses. Um, so stripping that mucosa can lead to scarring, can lead to osteoneogenesis and bony overgrowth, um, which can uh, cause you problems in the long term with that frontal sinus. And then because we can't take all the credit and blame ourselves completely, there can be underlying inflammatory processes um, that are just kind of patient-centered inflammatory issues that can cause a lot more edema, a stronger inflammatory response than an, another patient might have. Um, and I think this is something that we're just still trying to understand how one inflammatory process in the sinuses is, different, differ, is differentiated differentiated from another inflammatory process in, this, in another person's sinuses. You know, we're starting to talk more about endotypes versus phenotypes and trying to understand those underlying inflammatory processes better. And if we can understand the, that better, we may in the future have a better sense of who is more at risk for these types of issues than, than others and potentially could tailor our surgery and medical management to, to those patients. So some other things we can do that are potential um, surgical adjuncts. Um, you saw when I was doing that draft three procedure, the placement of um, the pliable thin silastic sheeting. And we'll just see another example of that here. So this is kind of that bell-shaped thin silastic sheeting being placed into the frontal sinus. Obviously this is not drug eluding. This is just simply a piece of, of thin silastic that's been cut. Um, almost like a T-tube to sit in, in the frontal sinus. Um, this is something I did a lot in my fellowship and um, earlier in my practice. I don't use this thin, thin silastic uh, sheeting as much anymore, um, but I do think it really did work well. Um, so it is an option and it is certainly less expensive than drug eluding stents, which you see pictured down here in the bottom right corner of the screen. These are the drug eluding stents um, that are impregnated with mimetazone. With this thin silastic sheeting, I do uh, pull this out at two weeks post-op um, with just a 45 Blakesley in clinic. It's, I make it long enough that it's pretty easy to grab without any difficult, difficulty if I do put that in. The other thing to consider about frontal sinus surgery is the um, ability of irrigations to actually penetrate the frontal sinus. So we have all of our patients really doing these irrigations after surgery. Sometimes they're medicated irrigations. Um, and for really trying to treat the frontal sinus, a couple of things are important. One, you really do need to hang your head forward um, 
for it to get even really into the frontal recess. The other thing that we know about irrigations from some of the flow dynamic studies that have been um, done is that the irrigation really doesn't get into the frontal sinus itself very well unless the patient has had a drill out procedure. So, um, you know, I think just taking into account what it is that you're trying to achieve with your surgery and your subsequent um, irrigations can also help tailor the surgery that you want to do for the individual patients. So um, how can we do better? Um, so, you know, I think there are some general principles of frontal sinus surgery that if we stick to these principles, it's kind of the best surgery that, that we can do. And then, um, you know, just kind of um, feeling good about what we've done and that we haven't taken any shortcuts. Um, so really you need to remove the cells in the frontal recess to allow room for dissection. So you need to remove those those ethmoid cells that are encroaching upon the frontal recess or even um, pneumatizing into the frontal sinus itself. Um, and really make sure you've thoroughly dissected those cells. Of course, we need to be aware of the lateral lamella of the cribriform, the orbital wall, the posterior table of the frontal sinuses, all of those things that can kind of get us in trouble. Um, and then be sure to not leave any bony fragments behind. Um, you know, I think that this is particularly important in the frontal sinus that we make sure that these little bone fragments aren't left sitting in the frontal osteum because that really can lead to osteoneogenesis and um, kind of bony stenosis of that frontal osteum. And as I mentioned before, if you have uh, stripped some of the mucosa, hopefully it's still at least intact and you can redrape that mucosa to try to minimize any exposed bone. And so those are kind of my general tips and principles for frontal sinus surgery. And I think that's all I have. So I'm ending a little bit earlier than I anticipated, but I, I'm open to any questions that, um, that anybody may have about the frontal sinus or anything else really about rhinology. Dana, thank you. That was a great talk. Obviously, I was interested in that as well. But so, um, I asked another panelist this morning, so I ask you, what is it that got you interested in rhinology in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it was a bit of um, coincidence. I, uh, I think I came into residency thinking that I um, was going to end up being a laryngologist. I was really interested in professional voice. Um, toward the end of my second year, I was accidentally put into a pituitary surgery. They my chiefs thought that I was doing a tube and, <laughs> and it turned out to be a uh, pituitary surgery. And this is before we had a rhinologist here at SIU. I did my residency training here as well. Um, and I was just kind of like blown away. I was like, this is really cool. And then I started reading a little bit more about rhinology. And I think that it was a few things. I think I, I like that there are uh, both quality of life surgeries as well as kind of more life-threatening um, diseases that we uh, take care of. Um, I like that there's still surgical and medical management. I love the technology. I love toys and fun uh, <laughs> gadgets in the operating room. So I think that was a big part of it. And then the thing that I, I really love is um, with rhinology, we're still pushing the boundaries of what we can do with skull-based surgery. Um, you know, of course, pituitary surgery is kind of the introductory um, skull-based surgery that, um, you know, we, we first started uh, to think about, but now we're thinking about we can access from the top of the spine to, to the frontal sinus, and now potentially even transorbital surgery working out more laterally in a, in a similar way to how we do transnasal surgery, incorporating transorbital surgery into our practices. I think, you know, we're just still really pushing the boundaries. And so I think yeah. it's just a lot of cool stuff. Hey, it looks like you have a question here. It says, why did you stop doing silastic stinting? Yeah, so I think um, I wasn't seeing a, a lot of uh, difference in my outcomes. What, if I use them or if I didn't use them. I kind of started doing some little studies on patients, you know, just for my own benefit, putting one on one side, not on the other side, just to kind of give myself some feedback um, to see if, if it was really making that much of a difference. And I didn't see it making a whole lot of difference. If I'm a little bit worried that it's gonna scar, I might still use it. But honestly, at this point, 
If I am worried that it's going to scar, I typically do put in um, a drug eluding stent. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that there's room for improvement in the drug, drug eluding stents. There, I don't uh, love everything about them. I do see some issues with more post-op infections than I, I have when I don't uh, use them. I kind of see this soupy kind of purulence that can um, um, sit around around the stent itself. Um, but I like the idea, and I think it's it's the the right idea. So I've kind of transitioned to using those if I'm concerned. Yeah, and I'll reiterate your point. I I can remember several years ago when I came out of fellowship, I was drilling everything on draft threes, and now I I tell our residents, I say we're going to do as much as possible with cold steel, and then if we need to, we'll whip out the drill at that point. Um, just because I was seeing all that contraction that would happen, and so um, it's. It's a, I think that's an important point for the residents that are listening to. Just because you get done with some level of training doesn't mean you quit learning. I, I certainly know that I feel like I've gotten better in the last, you know, six and a half years uh, than even right when I came out of fellowship. So, so very good. So anyone else out there listening have any questions for Dr. Crosby? I'm not seeing any, Dana. Well, we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, if you have any other faculty there, if you want to give another one in a few weeks, where I know we're kind of in this intermediate zone. When the when's the country going to reopen, and you know at what stages and such. And so we're always looking for more lectures, um, just because we're kind of doing this during daytime hours. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. 